It's been many years since we visited this location behind me and the paranormal reports continue. From shadow figures, banging of doors, footsteps. Ladies and gentlemen, we have returned 125 feet underground. Welcome to Kelvedon Hatch Secret Nuclear Bunker. Now, Charles, I don't know whether it was you that tapped me on my shoulder. Perhaps you were going past me. It's absolutely pitch black in here. You wouldn't be able to believe how dark it is. As I was saying, this is the first floor. Just through there is the sick bay. And in that sick bay area, there's a doorway with some bunk beds, and that's where a shadow figure's been seen and photographed, and it was in one of the local newspapers. Someone was touching my arm, tapping me under there. <laughs> You'll set it off and it'll play a tune. August 6th, 1945, 0815 in the morning, the United States drops an atomic bomb codenamed Little Boy on the Japanese city of Hiroshima with no warning given. After falling for 43 seconds, the time bellometric triggers start the firing mechanism. A uranium bullet fired down a barrel Together, they start a nuclear chain reaction. Solid matter begins to come apart, releasing untold quantities of energy. The day after Hiroshima was destroyed, Stalin summoned five leading scientists to the Kremlin. He ordered them to catch up with the US and develop an atomic bomb for Russia, regardless of the cost, and the race 
for nuclear arms began. It was against this terrifying backdrop construction work began on the Kelverden Hatch secret nuclear bunker in 1951. The local villagers and contractors knew nothing of what was concealed in the hillside or how it would be used. Work was completed in 1954 and it was first used as an RAF rotor station. Rota was a project initiated by the British government. It was a complex air defence radar system to repel potential attacks from the Soviet bombers. Personnel had to sign confidential documents agreeing to leave their loved ones above ground before entering the bunker in the event of a nuclear attack. The bunker then briefly became a regional seat of government until finally turned into the regional government headquarters. The bunker was designed to house up to 600 civilian and military personnel, including the Prime Minister and other high-ranking cabinet officials. In the event of a nuclear attack, the centre's tasks would have consisted of supplying protection to the nearby Ministry of Defence workers, coordinating the survival of the population. Sitting on a gravel bed which would act as a shock absorber in the event of a nuclear attack, the bunker's walls are 10 foot thick with reinforced concrete surrounded by a Faraday cage. It descends 125 feet underground and consists of three storeys with water tanks holding 24,000 gallons of water. In 1992, the bunker was decommissioned and the parish family, whose land had been requisitioned by the state in 1951 in order to construct the site, bought the land back from the government. Today, the structure contains 80 tonnes of original Cold War equipment, including plotting rooms, telecommunications, computers, a BBC broadcasting studio, office space, living quarters, a kitchen, a sick bay covering over 27,000 square feet. The reports of strange occurrences have been documented over many years. Shadow figures, footsteps, the opening and closing of doors, voices and full-bodied apparitions of RAF personnel telling visitors to get out. When we first investigated here, we experienced the paranormal activity for ourselves. I don't think uh, unless you were down here, you'd realise how dark it is. You literally cannot see anything. Two other gentlemen with me, Jeff and Mark. That's walking. Christ. Walking from behind you. Come through the door. Yo, Jeff. You alright? We dug deep in our research to try to uncover why the structure has paranormal activity. There were rumours of workers being killed back in its construction in 1951 
and also that the bunker is built on a burial ground that had been disturbed. We located the project manager, Ronald Horn, who oversaw the full construction of the bunker, who now lives in New Zealand, and during an interview, Ronald confirmed that there was no burial ground, and also there was no deaths involved during that time. Can, can I ask you this question? There is lots of theories and lots of speculation that the, the Kelvedon Hatch Bunker was actually built on an old graveyard or burial grounds and when you was actually there when the construction was taking place did you come across anything like that like bones or any old headstones or anything like that whatsoever nothing whatsoever nothing at all nothing at all okay um so that clears that matter up because that that's a big theory that's sort of going on um, now in the community that it was built on a, an old burial ground and of course you yourself would know that if anything like that would have turned up because you would have come across you know bones or old gravestones or anything like that so that uh, no, nothing no, like no, that whatsoever okay the other um, story that is um, that's been put out there is that under the construction um, of Kelverden Hatch um, that overnight there was a, a worker who whilst pumping concrete into one of the lower levels um, he fell into the concrete and drowned and all that was found was his his hat his hard hat and gloves and he was never seen again um, was was any of the construction workers um, killed or, or injured during during that, that event not, not, not in my memory no nothing at all Something has caused the activity inside Kelverden Hatch nuclear bunker and there are still classified documents still yet to be released to the public on what went on here. We set up our night vision static cams. Static cam 1 is on level 1 staircase looking down to level 3. Static cam 2 is in the sick bay. Static cam 3 is covering the government department's main area. Static cam 4 is in the common services. Static cam 5 is in the plant room air filter banks. So we're on the first floor and just through this way is the sick bay. Now in the sick bay there is a doorway with bunk beds um, and in that area a shadow figure's Stop been seen. Someone's touching my arm. Look at me in a minute. Someone was touching my arm, tapping me under there. I felt it, it was, it was just put like that. Mm. Sorry, sorry. I'm not caught on anything because there's nothing here. Right. Sorry about that, Jeff. Okay, well, Mark was just touched on his arm. So, as I was saying, this is the first floor, and just through there is the sick bay. And th in that sick bay area, there's a doorway with some bunk beds, and that's where a shadow figure's been seen and photographed, and it was in one of the local newspapers. Um, that area seems to have reports of shadow figures all the time. So that's where we're going to now.
So this is the, the sick bay area. And that's the doorway, just there where the, the shadow figure was photographed. So first of all, can I ask who the person is that wanders the sick bay? Can you tell me your name, please? My name's Jeff. The gentleman there is Mark. And the gentleman there is Phil. So you know our names. Please can you tell us yours? Are you an officer in the RAF, private, sergeant, colonel? Who are you, please? Can you stand in the doorway so we can see you? Is there something, something you can do to let us know that you are here and listening to us? Do you stay in this room? Is one of these beds yours? Something moved along the wall at the back very quickly and there was like a, a, a rumbling sort of noise from down there Something dark moves along the far wall in the bunk bed area and I hear a noise which could possibly be a deep voice is captured on my digital recorder. Here is the enhanced audio. Is one of these beds yours? Is one of these beds yours? Hello? Excuse me, sir. We'd like to know your name. Please, can you tell us? You see this device I'm holding in my hand? 
It will record your voice. Can you speak into the red light, please? In fact, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put the digital recorder, I'll put this digital recorder here on the bed and we'll walk out of here. And if you could tell us your name, rank and number, that'll be fantastic. After a few minutes, I retrieved the digital recorder which was placed on the bunk bed at the far end of the room and we have received a voice saying, so quiet. Here is the audio with enhancements. We move on to the government department's area where Phil will try to contact the spirit of Charles, an RAF officer that has been seen here on many occasions. Okay, I'm sat in what was the uh, communications part of the building. Um, in the event of uh, a major incident, um, it looks like uh, each uh, very important part of the government was allocated one desk. Now I don't know whether this was actually used, obviously it wasn't used for, a, for nuclear, but whether it was actually used in other conflicts at all. But even if it wasn't, there would have been certainly a lot of training exercises here. One of the things which I would like to know is whether there were people working here all the time or was, whether this building was just used for training. Now firstly, I'll introduce myself. My name is Phil. And I'd be really grateful if you could come and join me and tell me a little bit about the history of this place. You might not remember, but I have been here before. And when we were here last, two things happened in this room. Firstly, as I entered the room, I was tapped on the shoulder. The other thing which happened was that we saw a mist coming up out of one of the chairs. Now, if that was you, as I say, come and join me. Could you introduce yourself, please? Tell me who you are.
One of the names which has come up in the past is Charles. Now Charles, I don't know whether it was you that tapped me on my shoulder. Perhaps you were going past me. But are you here? Can you see me, Charles? Can you hear my voice? I need you to let me know that you can hear me and see me. And can you do that either by shouting? Perhaps you could knock. Is, is that something you could do? Make a noise. We go down to the second level and leave Mark in what would be the Prime Minister's quarters if a nuclear attack would have taken place. Phil and I then go back up to the first floor, leaving Mark all alone. Right, um, there's a clock running somewhere, I can't do much about that. Um, I'm on the second floor of Calverdon Bunker in what would have been the Prime Minister's private living quarters. Uh, compared to the rest of the living quarters, this is, this is quite luxurious. She would have had her, um, or whoever it was, he or she would have had their, um, they've got their own writing desk there, an easy chair, bed. Um, some nice pictures on the wall. Don't know whether they would have been in there back in the day if it was if it had to have been used. It's absolutely pitch black in here. You wouldn't be able to believe how dark it is. Did any prime ministers actually come down here and do? exercises in case the worst happened and there was a nuclear strike. Did any of the past Prime Ministers come down here and maybe practice what it was like living down here for maybe a few days or a week? If so, could you let me know into that little box there, black box with the red light? Or if there's anybody else who's in the corridor or maybe in this room or the next room. Maybe you could knock on something to let me know you're there or set the little device off there with the green light on it. It won't do you any harm. It will just make a buzzing noise and pretty lights will show on it. Or there's another box there that if you walk in the corridor... You'll set it off and it'll play a tune. <laughs> 